My dear respected brothers and sisters in Islam, if we pick up from last week, we were talking about some very difficult days of our beloved Prophet at the same time some of our community members were going through similar difficulties and those difficulties continue you know the Prophet had to endure a great deal in his life and this particular time that we're talking about because it was so hard for him, alayhi salatu wasalam, it was known as the year of sadness. After the passing of Abu Talib, his uncle, and of course his wife Khadija radiallahu anha, things just seemed to get worse. Abu Talib was the patriarch of the clan the Hashemite clan. And after his passing, Abu Lahab was appointed the new patriarch. And his leadership of that clan was very different than that of Abu Talib's leadership, especially when it came to the expected protection of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, as a clan member, Muhammad ibn Abdullah, that's our Prophet, the son of Abdullah, who was the brother of Abu Lahab, should have been backed by his clan. But Abu Lahab, he didn't have such a soft spot in his heart for his nephew as did Abu Talib. You know, Abu Talib practically raised the Prophet from a young age, brought him into his home. Abu Lahab didn't get to experience the closeness of Abu Talib, but rather Abu Lahab's heart was filled with, with rage. It was filled with anger and hatred for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his mission, calling people to the truth, inviting them to faith and to worship one God. And that, of course, was reflected in the clan's treatment of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and lack of, of, of protection. You know, this was a big part of their culture. It's just like supporting a family member. The way that we do with our sons and daughters today, we look after them, we, we, we you know, take care of them, we will, we will bend over backwards for them, our sons and daughters, we will do whatever we can to see that they have a good life. That's how it was in the clan, a very tight-knit family, and these things were expected. You could imagine... You know, your own child just shunning them and pushing them out. Throwing them to the wolves, if you will. And that is what was happening with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he went through many things. Up to this point, he went through many things, but it got worse at this time. You know, one time, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, they were, they had very, what we would consider crude construction of homes. And a lot of life was spent outdoors. And they would cook a lot of times outdoors within their courtyards. And the Prophet ﷺ had a pot on the boil. Somebody came by and threw a piece of rotting carcass into that pot. One time he was praying in his own courtyard in the privacy of his own domicile. And a man came and tossed the uterus of a sheep filled with blood and excrement on top of the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ coming home one time from the Kaaba. He was met by a man who picked up a handful of dirt and threw it in his face on top of his head. And he went home for his daughter to clean him off. And she wept as she began to wipe off his face. You can imagine the difficulty. I mean, it's one thing to be irritated. It's one thing to be annoyed. It's one thing to be made fun of, to be poked and prodded in such a manner, especially by members of your own family and community. But it's next level when your loved ones have to look on and watch. When your children have to see you go through such humiliation. And that's exactly what it was. You know, those types of things are not breaking bones or cutting off limbs, but they're humiliating. And that's what they were trying to do to the Prophet. If you imagine yourself right now, 
You know, as a parent, many of us here are parents. How would you feel if your kids has, had to watch you be degraded, to be debased, to be beaten up, and you have no real way to defend yourself or to retaliate? How would you feel? It would be perhaps more than ten times worse than if no one saw it. But then your own children had to witness that. You know, the daughter, as, as she wiped the face of her father, alayhi salatu was salam, he was... He was having to console her as opposed to the other way around. This was the nature of our beloved Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, forbearant, filled with resolve and patient. He wasn't a person of ego. And so these types of things he knew were a part of the job. And he was consoling her. He was saying, don't worry, for Allah will protect your father. And that was protection that they were unable to see during those moments. Where, where is this protection? You know, the resolve and the patience of the Prophet ﷺ is a great example. The resolve and the patience of our beloved Prophet ﷺ was a great example. And he was fulfilling the command of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَاصْبِرْ كَمَا صَبَرَ أُولُ الْعَزْمِ مِنَ الرُّسُلِ he says, and therefore be patient as did those of determination among the messengers. It's a command from Allah. Be patient like those of determination of the messengers. You know, the previous messengers, there were a number, there were a handful of them. They were extremely determined. Known for their forbearance. Because their people rejected them and they had to go through such great trials and difficulties. And they were Ibrahim, Musa, Isa, and Nuh. Peace be upon all of them. And of course, our beloved Prophet Muhammad وسلم, the best of all of them. These were great five, these were five great, mighty, and determined messengers of Allah. And Allah names them specifically. Specifically mentions them by name in the Quran, in Surah Al Ahzab, verse number seven, and Ashura, verse number thirteen. You can make reference of those later if you wish. And they were described in such a way due to the many challenges and the difficulties that they had to face, but more so the manner with which they met those challenges. How did they handle those difficulties? Well, you can see how the Prophet ﷺ was handling these challenges. He was handling them in the best possible of ways. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلْ لَهُمْ And be not in hurry for them. Right, so Allah commands the Prophet ﷺ to be patient like they determined the messengers. And he says, and do not be hasty. Do not hurry in regards to them. And what this means is do not rush to see to their punishment. Do not expect retaliation immediately. Meaning you have to wait. All in good time. Things will come around. And then he says, كَأَنَّهُمْ يَوْمَ يَرَوْنَ مَا يُدْعَوْنَ he says, and on, the, and on that day when they see that which they are promised, it will be as though they had not remained in the world except an hour of a day. Life is short, brothers and sisters. Life is short. The tests and the challenges, they will be done in the blink of an eye. It will all be over. Especially for those who are on the wrong end of truth and justice. Whatever they enjoyed, whatever they obtained, whatever they acquired of position or power or influence or wealth, success of this world, it'll all be over faster than they can ever imagine. Allah says, Balagh. And it's a clear conveyance. It's a clear notification. Let this serve as a notification. And he concludes with this verse. He concludes this, this chapter. فَهَلْ يُهْلَكُ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْفَاسِقُونَ but will any be destroyed except the defiantly rebellious people? The defiantly rebellious people, those that were attacking the Prophet ﷺ. Which means that Allah does not destroy anyone except those who choose the way of destruction. Allah is fair. Allah is just. He does not punish anyone except that they deserve such punishment. People that choose the way of destruction, they will find it for their own selves. Surah Al-Ahqaf. It's the last verse, 35. 
you know, things in Mecca for the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim community in general degraded to such a degree that Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he left the city. Where was he going? East Africa. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, a man of great standing, an influence in his community, well positioned. But because of his faith, and because of the many conversions that he was responsible for, all of that was lost. It was lost to the point that he now was ready to flee. He left the city. He was going to Abyssinia to, to join up with the first immigrants. You know, you, you can't have it all. And that's the story of this, this example of a book of Siddiq. You can't have it all. You know, you can't have all of this world and all of the hereafter. And Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he, he made a sacrifice when he chose to stand on the side of the Prophet ﷺ in such a way and to take on that level of support and outreach that he was having such an impact that he lost all of his influence. And now he was on the run. He had lost his own clan's protection, just as did the Prophet ﷺ. And had it not been for an out-of-towner, it was an out-of-towner as he was leaving, he ran into a neighboring clan who were allies with the Quraysh, who offered their protection for him, he would have left. But because of that, he was able to come back into the city. But there were some conditions for his, his presence. While they accepted the protection of that outsider clan, they said, look, he can't pray in public. He can't recite the Quran in public. They were afraid of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. You know, his influence with his clan was lost. He wasn't like Hamza. He wasn't like Omar in that he was physically scary. But... His influence with the people of Iman increased because of his, his religious and his spiritual power. So it was like it just, everything was taken from the dunya and given to him for the akhirah. And so Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, he had to stay at home and he had to pray in private and he was secluded when it came to his religious observance and practice. And he stayed there for some time doing that, you know, to honor the agreement. The Prophet ﷺ also had to look outside for protection. He was so determined to continue his mission work. You know, many people would just say, well, it's up, it's over, it's finished. We can go no further. No protection, no way to safely call to Allah. There's, there's too much at stake. There's too much could happen. We, and they would give up. But the Prophet, he, he was, we could say, desperate in a way. So he turned to the people of Thaqif in Ta'if. And this is where the desperation is, is well illustrated. Who were the people there in Ta'if? And, and, and why is it appeared to be such a desperate situation that the Prophet, would go all the way to Ta'if? Ta'if, you know, is like 50 miles from Mecca. It's not terribly far away. It's not like he had to go outside of the peninsula or anything. But he had to go to a people who were the custodians of the temple which housed the goddess Lat. Right? The, the, the prophet's mission was to call to Allah. But now he's looking for help from the people that, that housed that god Lat. You know, أَفَرَأَيْتُمُ اللَّاتَ وَالْعُزَّةَ Allah says in the Quran, so have you considered Allah and al uzza and Manat, the third, the other one, Surah Al-Najm? Lat was an idol carved from a large white rock. And it was venerated and honored. It was, it was positioned in a house with curtains surrounded by guards. And around that house were these great gardens that were like the pride of the people of Taif. And you know, they were so honored by that, that God, that, that idol, that they actually wanted to compete with the Kaaba. They thought that their, 
their house of worship would compete with that of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's how deluded, you know, that's the delusion of idolatry. That's the price that you pay when you turn away from Allah. Delusion. It's confusion. It's bewilderment. So the Prophet sallallahu he left Mecca and with him was Zayd ibn Haritha. And they left on foot, a 50-mile journey. 50 miles. You know, that's like a 14-hour walk. What does that mean? Because most of us don't walk anywhere. You, you might say, look, a 14-hour, I mean, no one wants to take a 14-hour drive. No one really wants to take a 14-hour flight, let alone a 14-hour walk. You know, most people, on average, they walk roughly six miles a day. On average, people walk around six miles a day. So imagine having to do a 50-mile stretch in the desert. And the Prophet ﷺ stopping along the way at each clan that he came across and he would, he would tell them about Islam. He would present Islam to them and invite them to the truth. And all the way to Ta'if, all of the clans that he talked to, no one would answer. No one would respond in the positive. And so he pressed on and he got to Bani Thaqif in Ta'if and he went straight to the heads of that clan they were the sons of Amr ibn Umair, Abdi, Abdi Yalayl, and Habib and Mas'ud. These were brothers. Abdi Yalayl, Habib and Mas'ud. He went straight to them and he presented Islam. And he began to talk to them about the truth, to talk to them about worshiping Allah. And they also turned away. One of them said, if Allah sent you, if Allah sent you, then I will go and shred the hangings in the Kaaba. Another said to him, could Allah not find anyone else besides you? And the third one said, you know, if, if Allah sent you and you're a messenger, then I'm, I'm no one to be talking to a messenger. But if you're a liar, then at the same time, you're not worthy of my presence. And he was rejected. And the Prophet, والسلام, this was the moment of desperation. The lowest moment, perhaps the darkest moment in his mission was yet again, rejected. And he stayed there. I mean, where else is he going to go? You can't go back to Mecca. The people have already run you out. You can't go back. He's staying there. What to do? And he continues to invite people, anyone, in thought, calling them to Islam, hoping that he would find a victor, a champion. And eventually, the, the heads of the tribe, they got so fed up and so tired and so angry, they told him, look, you got to go. They ran him out of the city. And they set up, these people along the route to leave. And there they began to pelt him with stones on the way out to add insult to injury. It's like the kids and the village idiots, they all lined him up and they began to pelt him with stones. And there's Zayd ibn Haritha trying to, trying to shield the Prophet with his own body. And he's getting hit. And eventually he was hit in the head, which led to a fracture of the skull. And the Prophet was injured and was bleeding. And he goes outside of the, of the city. Once he cleared the crowds, they're looking for shelter and they, found, they find a nearby orchard. They pull over. A nearby orchard. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to Allah. He turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he began to pray. It's a very famous prayer. He says, to you, my Lord, I complain of my weakness, lack of support and the humiliation I am made to receive. It's the old most compassionate and merciful. You are the Lord of the weak, and you are therefore my Lord. To whom do you leave me? Who have you left me to? A distant person who receives me with hostility or to an enemy? An enemy you have given power over me? He says, as long as you are not displeased with me, I don't care whatever I face. As long as you are not displeased with me, I'll take whatever you give me. I would, however, be much happier with your mercy. I seek refuge in the light of your countenance by which all darkness is dispelled. And both this life 
and the life to come are put in their right course against incurring your wrath or being the subject of your anger. To you, I submit until I earn your pleasure. And there's no might nor power except with you. You know, if you're interested in learning more about the prophet's resolve and also the connection that he had with the previous prophets and missions, then you should read about what took place in the orchard. There's a whole story to it. I'm not going to mention it to you. I'll leave that as a homework assignment. What happened in that orchard? It's quite amazing. It's a truly fascinating story. And you should look up the story of Adas. That's what you go on Google or whatever. Look up the story, the story of Adas in the orchard. You know, all in all, the trip to Ta'if was a major fail. It's like one failure after the other. The Prophet, alayhi salatu wasalam, he had to go home empty-handed and without support. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين من كل ذنب فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. بسم الله والحمد لله حمدا كثيرا طيبا مباركا فيه كم يحب ربنا ويرضى ونصلي ونسلم على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإسان إلى يوم الدين. So that's the story of Adas, not the story of Abbas. Adas with the two Ds. Not the story of Adidas, the story of Adas. You find the information and inshallah you will be um, amazed by what happened. You know, those are the major events. Pretty much sums up the year of sadness for the Prophet ﷺ. There was the death of his wife, the death of his uncle, further humiliation by his own tribesmen and clansmen, great pain and suffering, and finally rejection from all that he turned to, including who? The people of Let. I mean, how... How much lower can you go? Needless to say, it was a rough year for the Prophet ﷺ. And some of you are going through a rough year. You're going through a rough year right now. So one thing after the other just seems to be happening. It's just it's failing. It's going wrong. It's like everything that you touch, just, it's, not, it's not blossoming as you would like. Either that or there are just things that keep popping up, surprises, unexpected surprises, not welcome surprises, but things just jump out at you. And they put a wrench in the works, if you will. How do you deal with life when, when things are down and out? How do you handle the tough situations and the challenges? Well, you take a lesson from the prophet. I mean, that's what this is all about. That's what this series is about, life lessons from the prophet's biography is to take these tools in order to cope with our lives. So what do we do? Well, what did the Prophet ﷺ do at this moment? He pulled over. He pulled off the road. Sometimes we need to pull over. We need to take a minute. He pulled over to a quiet place in order to pray. Sometimes we need to do that. We need to pull over to a quiet place and we need to pray. You know... It helps you take a step back from your life. Take a step back and put your problems into perspective. That was what that prayer was all about. Is putting problems into perspective. As long as you are not ha as long as you are not displeased with me, then I will take whatever you give me. The perspective there is the worst thing is that Allah is displeased with me. Forget about the trivial trials of the dunya when the trial of the hereafter is much greater. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ did. He pulled over to get some perspective and to pray. One of the darkest moments of his life, he said, I seek refuge in the light of your countenance by which all darkness is dispelled. All darkness is dispelled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And both this life and the life to come are put in their right course. Meaning, I can discern between what is most important in my life. 
against incurring your wrath or being the subject of your anger. To you I submit. I surrender. That's part of our disappointment. Is that we haven't yet surrendered to Allah. We haven't yet submitted peacefully so. You know, we, we will be made to surrender. Like when the things happen to us and we're just fighting back with all that we have. Unhappy, unsatisfied, unwilling. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will buckle our knee. But to embrace that is when you will find satisfaction. He says, until I earn your pleasure. وَلَا حَوْلَ وَلَا قُوَّةَ إِلَّا بِكَ No power can overcome Allah. No might can overcome Allah. For only it is Allah that has the power and the might. The Prophet ﷺ was so certain that he would be delivered. You know, when he's consoling his daughter as she's wiping his face. He's so certain. Allah will protect your father. Don't, don't worry. Why are you crying? He simply needed to surrender. The Prophet ﷺ simply needed to surrender to the fact that things don't always happen on, on our time. That's where we have to surrender. Things don't happen on our time. Not now. I want it done later. Or I don't want it later. I want it now. That's the crazy thing about it. Something happens, oh, not right now, I want it later. The passing of a loved one, oh, not right now, I'm not ready, later. Things happen when Allah decrees, and it's our job to put in the effort and not become dissatisfied, disappointed, or frustrated with God. Rather, we put our trust in Him, and we keep hope alive. You know, the Prophet Wasallam, as he was approaching Mecca after having been pelted on the way out of Ta'if with his head down and in, in sadness and sorrow and I'm sure stress. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent the angel of the mountains with Jibreel alayhi salam. This was reported in Sahih al-Bukhari and Muslim. Aisha radiallahu anha, she said that she asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam if he had a harder day than, than the battle of Badr. Excuse me, the battle of Uhud. And we know that was a very difficult day. We'll talk about that sometime soon, inshallah. And he replied, he says, I've experienced, I've experienced uh, more difficulties, dangers from your people. Talking about the, the idolaters of Quraysh. He says, the hardest treatment that I met was on the day of Aqaba when I met with, when I met with Ibn Abd Yalil. The scholars, they say that this was during that time. When he was at Ta'if. He's the, one of the chiefs of Ta'if. And they were, he was inviting them to Islam. And, and that was when he needed help the most. And he was rejected. He said, I departed in deep distress. And I did not recover until I arrived at Qanat Tha'alib. Which is right outside, of, right outside of Mecca. He says, I raised my head and I saw a cloud which cast its shadow on me. And I saw in it Jibreel alayhi salam. And he called out to me and said, indeed Allah the exalted heard what your people said to you and the response they made to you and he sent you the angel in charge of the mountains in order to do to them whatever you wish. And so the angel of the mountains came and he said salam to the prophet والسلام, and he said I'm here to do whatever you want me to do and if you desire I will take these two mountains the mountains on the the outsides of Mecca, and I will close them together and I will destroy all of these people for you in Mecca. Then you can go home. Then you'll be safe. You don't need help. You don't need protectors. You don't need supporters. We'll end it for you right now and I will kill all of them. And what did he say? He said, no. He said, I would rather that from their offspring, there are those that will worship Allah alone and without partner. I rather hope that Allah will raise from among them and their descendants people who will worship Allah alone. What a test, right? What a moment. Failure appears to be imminent. For most, it would appear as if I'm going home. It's a suicide mission to walk back into the city. And I would be so desperate that anything that came my way, I would, I would go for it. 
The Prophet ﷺ, he could have taken revenge, which is the easy way out. He could have become angry and given into enmity and malice and hatred. But like the messengers that came before him, he was determined to submit to the command of his Lord. Be patient, as did those of determination among the messengers. And the Prophet ﷺ, he stayed the course. And he didn't come apart. He didn't fall apart even when he was presented with an easy way out. But he decided to press on, certain that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would bring about ease. And immediately, immediately after that, he was granted safe passage back into the city by none other than Al-Mut'im ibn Adi. You should remember this name. Al-Mut'im ibn Adi was one of the five leaders that went in to tear up that, that oath that the Quraysh took to boycott the Muslims. He was one of those. And he pledged protection to the Prophet ﷺ to go back home. And he got his sons and his nephews, and they put their battle armor on, and they escorted him back to the Kaaba. Brothers and sisters, this is an example of the life that we should live, a life of resolve, determination, and patience in the face of trial and tribulation. Allah says there is indeed a great example for you in the Prophet For those who hope to meet Allah and the last day and remember Allah often. You know when we're faced with these hardships and trials, we have to dig deep to find the strength of faith needed to be patient and to carry on. And it's certainly no easy task. I could, I could preach to you all day. This is the easiest part. The difficult part is finding that strength, but it must be done. It must be done. And we have to be confident that if we're successful in responding to the trials and the difficulties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not only deliver us from them, He will reward us with ease. Around every difficult corner there is ease waiting for you. And that's something that we're going to look at, the ease, one of one of the most magnificent gifts, if you will, one of the most miraculous occurrences in the life of the Prophet ﷺ happened right after this event. And we'll talk about that next week. But until then, I ask you all to pray for your brothers and sisters in Islam, especially locally. One of our longtime and beloved community members, Zafar Khan, passed away yesterday. You don't know, maybe you don't know, but if you're here in Ramadan, he's the one that's serving you. Or he was, rahimahullah. The one that would prepare and plan and organize and serve us during Ramadan. He passed away while visiting family in Pakistan, and he was buried there today after Salat of Jummah. He's survived now by his widowed wife, Aisha, and his children, Maryam, Usman, Ali, Abdurrafi, and Nur Jannat. Two of those children are ages three, and 10. So we ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his mercy upon him and give him strength and pardon him to be generous to him and cause his interest to be wide and wash him with water and snow and ice and cleanse him from transgressions as a white cloth is cleansed from its stains to give him an abode better than his home and a family better than his family in paradise to take him into paradise and protect him from the punishment of the grave and that of the fire. The family needs our help right now. And they need our condolences. And their assistance, they, are, they need our assistance in these dark times. These are their dark days. So let's not send them away empty-handed. Tonight, Sister Aisha will be here uh, for Salat al-Isha, which is at 7 p.m. So I ask you to come if you have the opportunity. You can offer your condolences. And it's also encouraged to prepare food. This is encouraged to prepare food so that the family has one less thing to think about in the days and weeks to come. Prepare something that can be stored, perhaps, so they can access that as is needed. We ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to that which he loves and is pleased with, that he protect us from all evil and deliver us from hardship, and he asked that he lighten our we ask that he lighten our burdens and bless us with a good end. Wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa akhir da'wana. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.